Thank you, Matt. Um, I appreciate everybody's coming down off the backside of the caffeine buzz from the last coffee break, so we'll try to keep this relatively short. Uh, mostly going to give you a bit of a picture of what Compass is, because as Matt said, it's a little bit outside the, um, the boxes of his topology, um, uh, although it's in one that he showed us earlier. Um, so Compass is an organization, as Matt said, that helps scientists engage effectively in society's dialogues about our future, which is a very vague way of saying that we think that the, the research community and scientists in particular have a lot of really, really useful stuff in their heads and oftentimes simply lack the knowledge and the skills or the bandwidth uh, or the understanding of where and when to share it to, to, ha to, to do the best good for society. Um, but the, the motivation is often there, and that's something we see again and again, at least with the scientists we, we get to work with. Um, we, we share or we give scientists skills. Uh, we help them build connections and understanding to, to be as productive a, a member of the of various societal dialogues as possible. Through a, a number of uh, mechanisms, coaching, we, we will do one-on-one -on -one or small group coaching with scientists to help them figure out when and where and how to share what they've got to say. Um, we do a lot of convenings where we'll bring scientists together with <coughs> members of the policy community or members of the, uh, the journalism community or other members of the research community that they're not well connected to. Um, and we, we also really very consciously through all we do are trying to change the culture of the science community to, be, to, to value and prioritize reaching out and sharing what they know in an effective way. So this, this whole round table is very exciting to me. Um, Brooke, my executive director from this morning, uh, flagged that we are a, um, a boundary organization. And the, the perspective that I'm going to share here is a little bit more on the ground. Um, uh, and I also want to make clear that while uh, some of the sort of broad public outreach discussions that have been flagged here are a part of, uh, are served by some of what we do, our focus tends to be more on the direct interpersonal interaction between scientists and others. Um, and I, I also want to go back to something, Rick, I, I really like your phrase, the management of the trust portfolio, a slight, um, uh, slightly different facet of that, which I think a lot about is the concept of credibility, which is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. And the way we get our work done is by understanding and managing credibility across these boundaries that we work on. Um, I also want to go back to something that was brought up this morning uh, in a few different forms. The idea of an aggregator or an aggregating mechanism for scientists to interact with outside communities was brought up in the, uh, I think in the first panel this morning, um, which I was listening to uh, remotely uh, because of the, the lovely weather we've had this morning or the last couple of days. Um, the, w one of the mechanisms that was talked very explicitly about was the, the outreach model. Um, the Compass is also an aggregator. And I, I think of us as an aggregator of credibility. We are able to, we have credibility within the science community because we have, uh, we've done very effective work with them, but almost everybody on the Compass staff has a background in science as well. We understand their culture. Similarly, we have a lot of credibility with the policy community because we've worked with them and shown them the value of sitting down with scientists in, a, in very carefully constructed conversations. And we have a lot of credibility with the world of journalism, again, from a background uh, in those communities. And this is one of the things that I think sets Compass apart from some of the other institutions uh, and boundary-spanning organizations out there is we not only draw from expertise in those communities, but to the extent that we can, we all still are active participants in the communities we try to connect. We think about those connections as having to cross cultural divides, and that's how we help scientists understand what it is they need to do to be effective in, in reaching out to and engaging in a, in a two-way dialogue with these communities. Um, and which is an increasing focus of what we do. Not just pushing your knowledge out there, not just sharing data, but actually getting in involved in a conversation so you can bring the entire depth of your knowledge of your field and how that data came to be and what it means. You can bring that into the conversation if you understand where your audience is coming from. Um, as I've already said, we, we really are focused on bringing scientists themselves into these conversations. We're not the issuary experts. We simply can see where the opportunities are to make connections where a really productive conversation can take place. Um, part of this actually gets to the issue of time that's come up again and again and again. An individual scientist, that sci there are plenty of scientists who work very hard and successfully cross the boundary and communicate with policymakers, with journalists, with others, and people from those communities who reach out to and communicate very effectively with scientists. 
But what we are able to do is see where opportunities are, where there are very, very high yield opportunities for those to happen in a way that those individuals wouldn't be able to do on their own. They don't have the time to spend uh, in full-time jobs like, like we uh, have the pleasure of doing to understand um, when the science community has something very valuable to contribute to a policy discussion or when a policy discussion could help shape how the academic community approaches the very questions they're trying to ask. Um, the, one of the fun things about this work is that we get a lot of uh, really wonderful feedback from the scientists who, who will say, I, it's been a pleasure working with you guys because for the first time I was able to step in the door and understand the context of the conversation I was stepping into, contribute in a meaningful way, and not feel like there was an agenda that I was trying to guard against. Um, we're very particular that while we are involved in policy discussions, we don't have a policy endpoint we're trying to drive those discussions toward. We are really about getting the scientists in the room to be participants in a way that can help uh, drive a richer conversation rather than a particular direction. Um, and the, um, similarly, the policy community often, policymakers, which is what my, my expertise is in or my, and my experience is in, it, it's very common that we'll come out of one of these convenings between scientists and policymakers and one of their big reactions is, uh, it is such a pleasure to get to sit back and think and in a, in a big picture way and talk to experts in a, in a context where we don't feel like we are having to filter everybody's agendas. It's a very open and, and constructive conversation. Um, and both sides of, this, of these conversations often really value that. Um, and which actually, which is relevant here, I, th I think here, because the motivation, there's a lot of motivation for, the, for people on both sides of this to, to re-engage and continue the conversation when it starts in a, in a frame like that. Um, because we don't have, uh, because we, we walk into policy conversations without an agenda, because we're really focused on the scientists themselves, um, not an institution. We don't have a membership, for example. Uh, there are not particular scientists we're trying to advance. There's not an institutional agenda or an institutional um, brand that we're trying to advance. We find that we're often somewhat, dis um, we're unexpected, which can be a bit disruptive. Policymakers will keep expecting us to, to have an ask. Scientists um, are often trying to figure out what our agenda is because um, oftentimes they're a little, they're often asked by NGOs with, um, with advocacy agendas that sometimes either are not consistent with what, what they want to be doing or just not what they want to be doing. Um, so th this can be a little bit unsettling or it may not be unsettling, uh, hard to understand sometimes. Because of this, um, because of this we see cultural and financial challenges to, to what we do, or, or I should say rather that there's sort of a struggle to get the cultural and financial support that we need to do the work we do. Culturally, this is outside the bounds of scientist training and outside their comfort zones of, oftentimes. Um, I mean, we've been talking a lot about the scientists who have been very successful at reaching out and have made it part of their lives. There's still a huge number of scientists out there for whom stepping out in public, stepping out to talk to policymakers is very discomfitting. It's, it's very, it makes them very uncomfortable and is outside their, um, their experience. Uh, it's also not traditional science outreach. It's not press releases and it's not about um, just sharing a particular result. It's about bringing the knowledge that you have generated into a, uh, into a dialogue rather than just a push model of, of sharing the, the results of, some, of research. Um, from a funding perspective, it's very dynamic and opportunistic. The policy needs often change on a fairly rapid, or at least policy, uh, the, the points at which you can discuss a particular policy topic often change fairly rapidly in a way that makes it very hard um, to fit within a lot of funding models, especially research funding models where you get a two or three year grant and the opportunities to connect that may come up in a couple of months. Um, it's also, again, because it's not about advancing specific goals, it often doesn't fit very well with philanth uh, philanthropic foundations strategies, which often involve very particular outcomes. Um, and in the interest, I think, of, of closing this out quickly, um, I, I want to just reemphasize that the, the appetite that we hear from both the policy community and the science community is really big. Uh, we, that there are far more opportunities than we can take advantage of to, to make these connections. And again, the, the kinds of connections we make are the very direct person-to-person -person connections. Um, but the uh, um, sort of the aggregating role that we play in bringing our credibility as uh, effective conveners, the credibility of the scientists and the credibility of the, the policymakers or the journalists or whoever they're connecting with uh, and managing that very carefully is, um, I think it's one of the things that makes it work and is one of the really big institutional challenges in, uh, in cracking this whole thing. Hey, uh, so th yeah. Thanks, Chad. Yep. Uh, 
Uh, Jack Schultz is a professor and director of the Christopher Bond Life Sciences Center at the University of Missouri, uh, where he integrates the research of 40 investigators from 12 academic departments and manages a, a substantive outreach program. Uh, he's also uh, leading a Howard Hughes Medical Institute training grant that teaches uh, students, faculty, and journalists to communicate science to broad audiences. 